Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the future of payments. My name is Pierre Meyer, and uh, along with Stefan, we've been working in the field for a while now, which is why we decided to create this group, this meetup, for people in the industry like you to know each other, to learn from each other, whether you're interested in billing, in payment, in POS system, or simply e-commerce in general. We have a great agenda for you tonight. First of all, Martin Westhead, Director, Global Payments at Groupon, will talk to us about the challenges Groupon faces and also go over the history of the Kill Bill project since he has actually been involved with the project since day one, long time before Groupon. Then uh, Stefan will talk to you about the Killbo project in general. We'll go in um, more detail how Groupon uses it. Martin, take it away. Thanks, Pierre. I only really have two topics here. The first one is um, to tell you a little bit about some of the challenges that we have at Groupon around payments. This is mostly the stuff, well, all the things I'm going to talk about are a part of my organization. I'm responsible for the engineering for these features. The first is global payments, which is um, customers paying Groupon for Groupons. Um, we operate in 49 different countries. We have something like 60 different payment integrations in those different countries. And uh, we are in the process of unifying our technology around Kill Bill to provide um, a, a consistent technology stack for those integrations. So... The next part of what I'm going to talk about is Kill Bill, and I'm going to talk a little bit about why we found ourselves in the position where it made sense to build our own billing system. So I don't know if anybody here has heard of a, a product called Ning. It was a Mark Andreessen social network startup. Uh, it started out as a free product and um, was very successful in, in growing rapidly, but we hit a few speed bumps along the way and we reached a point where it was clear that we needed to uh, figure out what the right business model is. And um, after trying a number of different alternatives, uh, the team decided that where we were going to put our money was on subscription billing. So we were going to turn this free service into a paid service, and we were going to charge everybody um, between um, 5 and, and, and $50 a month for, for using what we were offering. Uh, and so we had to rapidly provide come up with a subscription billing solution. Uh, so we integrated with a third-party provider. Um, we actually used Zora. My team came in, so, so I, was, I was running the team. Stefan and Pierre were both part of it. And um, we, we kind of took over shortly after the integration had completed. And we ran with Zora for about a year. And um, at the end of the year, we decided we needed to write our own billing system. So let me explain a little bit about why. Uh, the, the nature of our service was that we had um, three different clients. The e-commerce site that was actually where you would buy a Ning product, um, the, the Ning product itself, and our internal admin tools. So all of those pieces required some interaction with the billing system to get information in and out about what was going on. Um, and so obviously we didn't want them all to connect across the big wide internet, so we introduced a proxy server in between. Uh, seemed like a good idea. It could help us with a bit of resilience if there were any outages. Um, but what started happening was we, we found that this provider didn't actually meet all our requirements for business logic. There were little pieces missing here and there. None of them seemed like a big deal at the time, so we started adding wrappers around our functionality putting more and more business logic into the proxy service. Um, the plan that I had for this was that what we were going to do was ultimately convince Sora to implement these things the way we'd done them and then re you know, unwind ours and, and replace it with theirs. Um, <clears throat> what, what happened was that this turned out to be a very, very painful way to try and do things because uh, we ended up with a lot of state in the proxy service and a lot of state, obviously, return, remaining in, in Bella, in, in, uh, in Zora. And we ended up with this uh, situation where it was very easy for the two systems to get out of sync. One system would end up thinking something was one way, one, the other system would end up thinking it was another way. And, um, you know, an example would be uh, cancellations. We wanted to cancel a subscription. 
Sometimes Zora will, will disallow a cancellation for business rules. And we weren't able to necessarily anticipate all of the business rules that would lead to that situation. And so we got into a situation where we'd trigger a cancellation and it would fail. And at that point, it, I mean, what do you do? Right? Do you roll back? Do you try and roll back the cancellation? Do you uh, proceed with the cancellation here and, and, and leave us in a split brain state? Um, and so we faced those kind of problems and, and truly working through them became a very painful experience. I've got an example on the next slide of a piece of business logic that was, it seems like it's like an obvious thing. Like it would be so easy to fix this. Why, why would this cause these kind of problems? But we, we didn't have a, 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 a trial uh, implemented on our third-party system that worked for us. The, the solution they offered was um, you could start, to, you could buy a subscription now and you could start it in 30 days' time. So it seems reasonable. It gives you the right billing. What's the problem? Well, the problem is that we have three clients, and they need to know what a subscription is right now. What kind of subscription does that user have today? Well, what we're going to have to do is we're going to write business logic that's going to be replicated three times. That's going to have to call the cloud provider and say, okay, what's the subscription state? And then realize that there's a subscription in the future between now and 30 days from now, and therefore deduce that we must be in a trial state. You see where I'm going with this, right? It doesn't work. So we had to build our own idea of a trial subscription. But now we have a bunch of logic here. We've got to keep track of the fact we have a trial and a paid subscription, two subscriptions. This one needs to be canceled at this point here. This one needs to be started at this point here. If we upgrade, we now have two subscriptions that need to be upgraded. If we downgrade, we've got... And so it goes on. And so we found ourselves building more and more of this kind of wrapper business logic with all these additional features, and it became very, very painful. And so at the end of about a year, we reached the decision um, for Ning that it made sense to embark on a project to build this ourselves. Uh, and we had a bunch of requirements that we wanted to solve as part of that process, including the ability to be able to add business logic. And part of the problem here is the business logic we were adding was tightly coupled to the billing system, but it was going over this thin API and via a, an internet connection. And so we wanted a system that it was easy to add new business logic to via some kind of plug-in capabilities that allowed you to tightly couple new pieces of business logic because we felt it was inevitable that you were going to run out of um, you know, you were never going to be able to anticipate with a single system all the business logic requirements of all the different subscription systems that people would want to build. And so that's really the genesis of what we started from. And uh, I'll hand over now to Stefan, who's going to say a little bit more about the system and how it works. Thank you, Martin. So what is Kill Bill? So Kill Bill is a platform to build billing and payment systems. So it's not a generic platform, it's not your JBoss, it's just a specific platform for that use case. Also, when you, when you, when you start comparing systems, you know, often you look at the marketing slides of people having billing systems and you see this chart with these columns and you have billing system one, two, three, and you have 256 features and this one is green, 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 red, red, red. And we could do that and compare ourselves, but I think the main difference really for us is not in terms of the features. It's, it's the model that we adopted. So for one thing, we decided to go open source. There are two main drivers for that. One, when you think about all the billing use cases that you can have, all the catalogs, you know, we talked about trials. Uh, you can talk about billing in advance, in arrear. You can talk about all the cancellation policies. All that stuff, when you want to start testing, and all the usage model, when you want to start testing all that, the matrix is huge. So, open source is great for that, because we have all you guys in that room that will do the testing for us and report the bugs. Thank you. So, that's one reason. The second one really is about the architecture, and we didn't know that first. So, when we decided to go open source, we had different reasons, but... The one that we discovered later was that when you start to go open source and you really want to do a good job about it, you have to make your code as clean as possible because you can't have your own business logic 
in your system. You can't have your Groupon specific code. You can't have your Ning specific code. You need to abstract it. You need to have that code modular. And when you look back and you look at what we built, I think that's where we did a good job. Open data. So the open data, really what it means is owning your data. So we learned from experience what Martin described earlier, that uh, with the system that we had, that little proxy in front of the cloud provider, we learned that uh, when your exec come back to you and ask you for numbers, if you don't have the data, it's very hard to give the numbers. So we started to build at the time, we built like this complicated ETL system that would synchronize the data every night. But of course, it would get broken, never work. Frustration happens, exec not happy, nobody's happy. So by actually embracing that and, and owning your billing system, you have your own data and all, and all those problems suddenly disappear. The last bullet is the open architecture. It's linked to the open source in a way what I described with the modularity and the cleanliness of the code. So now you have this platform that is generic, but by definition, if it's generic, it's not gonna fit your specific need. So we need something else on top of it. We need a way to, to tweak that system so that from a generic system, it becomes the system that you want. And that thing is what we call open architect. So that is a logical view of what the system looks like. So we have uh, three different logical layers. One is what we call the platform, and I will describe a little bit later what it is. Uh, one of the things that it does is all the life cycle. So initializing, starting, stopping, all what we call the core services. The core services are really the bulk of the payment and billing code, right? So it's account management, invoicing, payments, dunning, everything. And then on top of it, we have the plugins. So plugins could be plugins that we wrote ourselves because we think they can be some kind of generic plugins. For instance, integrate, integration with payment gateways or things like that. Or they could be the place where you, where you have your own custom business logic to tweak that system in the direction that you want. Platform. So, uh, one of the things that is different in Kill Bill is the, is the model what we, that we decided to take. Uh, so when, 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 you, when you think of billing system, often they are batch oriented, right? So what happens is you have to uh, let's say schedule every six hours, 12 hours, every day, you have to schedule the invoicing, right? So the system will go through all the accounts and start generating invoicing. In our case, what we wanted to do is something that is more reactive. So we, ha we built an event-based system, which means every time there is a change in the system, the system will emit an event and the whole system will be aware of it. And not only that, but we build it in a, in a way that we have strong semantics. So what do I mean by strong semantics? What I mean really is that every time you persist your state on disk, you're guaranteed that an event will be generated. So you never end up in that situation where, oh, I'm not sure, maybe the event is missing. So we spend a lot of time doing that. Another feature is the multi-tenancy. So that multi-tenancy means really that you can have uh, multiple customer uh, running on the same deployment. So that's also in the platform because every single piece of the system has to be aware of which tenant uh, the operation is, is dealing with at the time. Another thing that we built, which is really specific to billing and payment, is all the audit, audit trail and history. So when you, when you do an operation, you want to know who did it, why, and when. So all that stuff has been abstracted so that each of these core services I was mentioning before uh, doesn't have to do extra work and automatically we save that. And then one more, one more thing I want to say about that platform is uh, something that we use extensively for the test, which is having a global clock. 
So what it really means is that the system has its own view of time. Obviously, for production, the time is really the time in which we are, and, it, and it, you don't want to tweak it. But when you, when you want to run some tests, so for instance, let's say you want to cancel a subscription in the future, end of term. How do you test something like that? So in our case, it's fairly easy. You write little test which creates the subscription, then cancels it in the future, then you, you move the clock, so you tell the system, hey, I'm not here, I'm here, and then you just wait and see what happens. As I said, we are even based, so an event will be generated for that cancellation, and you can verify that it's happening. Core services, so those, each of these cute little box here is a separate module, separate jar, and it exports its own API. There is a hierarchy here, so it goes from the bottom to the top. And so what we did for the communication between the modules is we designed a, a way in, in order to prevent having too much coupling, right? Where, where each box calls the next and you start to have like this mesh of things calling each other. So what we did here is we have a flow of events that starts from the bottom and goes to the top. And then each of those box can call the box below them in terms of API call to retrieve the state or change the state of the system. So for instance, let's say somebody creates a subs subscription. So the entitlement system will be notified. It will, it will send an event, say, hey, there is a new, there is a new subscription in the system. The invoice system here will listen to all the entitlement notifications and will react to it. It will attempt to create an invoice by just fetching the state of the account, entitlement, and the catalog and try to compute that invoice. If indeed there is a new invoice, it, the same will happen now. The invoice system will now generate an event on the bus and then this time the payment system which listens to the invoice module will now get the information that a new invoice was there and will react to the invoice and make the payment. And the story continues, same thing for the dunning or overdue box. So we talked a little bit about the platform, we talked about the core services, and then the last layer is the plugin. So what is a plugin? So a plugin, really what it means is it's a piece of code that plugs in. And it plugs in to one of the core services using what we call a plugin API. So we have multiple plugin APIs. So for instance, we have a payment plugin API. We have invoice plugin APIs. And so what happens here is that those kinds of plugins can extend the functionality of that core service. For instance, for the payment subsystem, let's say you want to do an integration with some gateway, payment gateway or payment processor. So you can write your own little plugin and, and write all the code that integrates with the gateway. So in a way, you become the extension of the payment system. So those plugins sit at the top of the chain, so they have access to all the system events, which means that they know everything which is happening in the system. They have access to all the APIs, which means they can retrieve the state of any object and change the state as well. We also give them a handle to the database, so if you want to, to store your own state to do something a little bit more involved in your plugin, you can do that. And we also give them the ability to export their own endpoints. Okay, so we talked about Kill Bill, uh, the server, right? So now there is a little world around it. Uh, so we have client libraries. Uh, we have some in Ruby, Java, and we started the work in other languages, but it's becoming hard with two guys to just do every single language on earth. Uh, we have about 30 plugins. We also built our package manager. 
Because the deployment, when now you want to deploy Kill Bill, which is a server with a set of plugins, uh, becomes a little bit difficult if you do it by hand. So we have a tool that is called KPM, Kill Bill Package Manager, where you can have a configuration and basically it's going to install everything you need. And of course we have a UI, so we have an administration UI that your support team can use, uh, which is fairly complete. Uh, you can obviously see the state of every single object in the system and do a lot of the operations that you would expect to do. Account creation, subscription creation, change plan, all the payment, refund, invoice item adjustments. Uh, we, that UI also has the capability to have a role-based access. So if you have different groups of people in your team, they can have different roles. And then finally, we also have analytics dashboards, which work uh, in conjunction with a plugin that we wrote, which is the analytics plugin. So we're going to discuss now a little bit about the use cases that we have of Kill Bill at Groupon. So the first one is uh, subscription billing. So there are already quite a few teams in, in Groupon that are invoicing their customers using subscriptions. They have different solutions to do it. They rely on third-party cloud offering. And each of those is done in its own way, own fashion. We also have a lot of teams, projects, that would like to experiment by doing subscription billing to see how it works, whether is it a good strategy. But the problem is the time to market to do that is too high. So often it just doesn't happen. And then another thing that we noticed around subscription billing is that in some cases we have bad customer experience. So in one case, for instance, we have uh, customers for a given project that have to enter their credit card twice. One for the cloud offering that takes care of the subscriptions and another time for Groupon to have the credit card. And then finally, uh, all that there is a cost around it each time. Each of these team that has to integrate with third-party cloud offering has to pay the price for it. So what we decided to do is create something that we call internally subscription as a service, which is basically a deployment of Kill Bill using the multi-tenancy feature that we have. The way it looks is that each team will belong to one tenant and will have the ability to upload its own catalog, its own overdue configuration, its own invoice templates if needed. We also recently worked on our admin UI and our analytics dashboard, so those are now also fully multi-tenant. So we now have the full story for that. Another use case is about global payments. You may have heard the term one playbook that Groupon uses uh, publicly to refer to the project which is uh, to streamline its footprint, its operations across the world. As you probably know, Groupon grew very rapidly by doing lots of acquisition and across various countries and nations. Uh, and uh, this led to integration challenges. The one playbook is the um, answer to solving these challenges. We've been working on that uh, with Groupon on the payment side of things, and Kill Bill is the one playbook answer uh, to these integration challenges. So what, does it, what, what is it going to look like? Kill Bill is being deployed across all regions, APAC, EMEA, North and Latin America, and individual teams will develop their own plugins to talk their, to their individual payment providers uh, or acquirers uh, or payment gateways. This means Groupon really will have a single API to call to trigger any type of payment, regardless of the type of payment method, regardless of the country, etc. I'm listing uh, some numbers here to show you the, the complexity 
of, um, of the projects in terms of designing an API that would be flexible enough to support all of these use cases. To give you an example, let's talk a little bit about Latin America. Uh, it's, uh, we're fairly advanced in rolling out that project, and we had some challenging along the, the way when looking at the type of payment method which were actually very popular over there and we needed to support. You may know that there are a lot of un and underbank in Latin America, meaning people do not have access to credit or debit card. So if you don't have a credit card, how do you pay online? Well, you pay by cash. If you don't know how that works, it usually involves printing a voucher. So you go to Groupon.com. In the checkout flow, you will, uh, you will be prompted with a, with a voucher. You print the voucher. You go, say, to your next door 7-Eleven. You pay by cash. And when the cashier scans the barcodes, a notification is sent back to Kill Bill via the gateway, notifying that the uh, payment is successful. So this is very asynchronous model, very different from your regular auth capture, um, and we had to, uh, to work with that. In case you're interested in, uh, in cash-based payment method, take a look at the Boleto in Brazil, the Boleto in Colombia, uh, or at the 7-Eleven uh, vouchers. So taking a step back at the One Playbook initiative, uh, what does Kill Bill give to Groupon be, be, beside the single API I talked to you about? We believe our solution now gives them more flexibility compared to what they have before. In the previous slide, we had a plugin for a certify for certain countries in Latin America. This plugin is generic. It's a plugin for a certify. It does, it's not a plugin for a certify in Latin America. This means that the plugin that is now available in Latin America is available everywhere in the world. And the Japan team tomorrow, if they wanted to use a certify for their fraud detection, um, uh, the credit card fraud detection, they could use the plugin right away. So it really lowers the time to market and distribute the, word, the work across the world. Additionally, these plugins uh, are pretty much vendor agnostic when it comes to Kill Bill. Kill Bill knows that there are plugin running doing fraud detection, but it doesn't know it's in a certify uh, fraud detection plugin. This means Groupon can now play a little bit with other vendors very easily. We've actually been working recently with a European-based company called Feedseye, and they have a unique approach towards um, fraud detection. Unlike traditional systems or vendors, they're not, um, their decisions are based on machine learning, data science, and not rules, static rules. And it would be very easy tomorrow for Groupon to say, hey, let's take 100,000 transactions in Brazil, route it to a certify, and FeedSeye compare the results and make a decision whether one solution is more effective compared to the other, maybe depending on the country, maybe depending on the payment method, et cetera. I mentioned the, the payments flow, the, the cash-based payment methods. There are many more flows that we, we've been working on to support. Uh, we've been work, working with a Russian team to support the SMS-based flow um, using dumb phones. Uh, we've, of course, support uh, Bitcoin, cryptocurrencies, and um, any type of payment flow, really, you can think of uh, we're pretty confident we got it covered. And finally, we now support payment routing. This means that at runtime, you can decide to shift traffic from one gateway to the other. This was actually handy uh, while rolling out certain countries in Latin America because the existing infrastructure was integrating with the legacy provider. We knew the provider was going away, or at least this specific API for this specific payment method. But we didn't quite know what the new API would look like. So we were wondering, what should we do? Should we write a plugin just for uh, maybe Q1 and then wait to write the next plugin when the new API comes, uh, comes along? Or should we halt the migration for this country? What should we do? Luckily, we had the ADN plugin. 
and EDN still supports that legacy provider for that legacy payment method. This means that we decided to shift the, the traffic for that specific payment method to ADN, which gave us some time to think about what we want to do moving forward. Uh, I'd like to take the opportunity to thank Groupon for having us tonight. Let's, be, let's give them a big round of applause.